Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of Royal Prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the Door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy am asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for Old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was gonna have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts and her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six, oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might've heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening in what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, Although, there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen's Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim, or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number four, short kings unite. Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. 
When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just want to be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room when the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s. At least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time. It was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion. So, how's that? She ruled over what's considered the well wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshephut, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth, though, recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdu El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin bust. 
Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head like that's really but three years later officials decided to release that to the public So here it is. Take a look the Queen Nefertiti 3d bust Scanned by James Bond secretly number seven monuments men It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust sometimes it was a bust I had to. I had to. Why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After after radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasures, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet or finished at least. So instead they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close, let's just Give me a shovel, I'll get in there, I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, 
brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Number 10, Boudicca. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact, she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the Imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St. Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number nine, Nefertiti. Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatu, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. There's like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number eight, Anne Boleyn. Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, 
here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church, so when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kind of had to go, prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. God, I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Queen Dida. Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dita here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor and well, she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes, how dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dita got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kishmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kishmir has ever had. Number 6. Queen Nandi Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She-Elephant. She alongside her son wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who funnily enough remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the empire ever existed in the first place, and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kinda get it. Number 5. Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number 4. Queen Theodora Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for her dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite 
She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer, an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army invaded England, took the throne and she became queen regent for her son Edward III until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband Edward II while he was captured. Eventually her son would come into power and she was imprisoned for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two, Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the fifth century, marrying King Chilperic. And organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brunhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number one, Cleopatra. A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic, which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. Number 10, Marie Antoinette. I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France. To sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, lay Miz reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Number nine, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Sometimes it's just in the name, isn't it? Like Mario, you know that he's an Italian plumber. Or Luigi, you can tell that that's an Italian plumber's brother. And uh, King DDD, king of the DDDs or, or something, I, I don't know. Okay, maybe the names don't always give it away, but Bloody Mary does. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake were hotter, no cap. Number eight, Rana Valona of Madagascar. This one is a new one for me, didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Rana, Queen, I'm, gonna say, I'm just gonna call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, how can I make things better? 
Oh, I know. How about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes, very uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately, she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and yeah, it's a bad thing. And it does bring some bad stuff with it. However, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe. And that's, that's good. Money's good. You like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that. So she reformed. And by that, I mean she repressed and, and re-unalive people. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing. And me a familia. You know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taken over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging, oh wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's all right. Bad segue. Well, the, the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear sweet mother. Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys. No words. Number six, Fu Hao. Another woman in history married to a man in the stinky patriarchy. Worst, except Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. Number five, Tamiris. Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization VI, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities, and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ Six player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about this Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which given how the way women were treated back then probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. But what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there. And Vietnam was a much smaller country, or kingdom I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That, that is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Have I see land lovers? Ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm going to ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. 
and maybe you could cast me in there. And I could put on some long red hair and some boots and I could, I could swim and put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage, per se, than her, but it's her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap. Just don't. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat, and worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back on the tube when I was done with it. Oh, I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally. And now I gotta make my bed? Oh, this is the worst day ever. I'm sure no other cute boy with blue eyes like me ever had this problem. Ugh. Okay, comment reading time. Uh, we got a comment from Captain America. He said, your impressions are hilarious. Keep up the great work, sir. Thank you very much, Captain America. And thank you and, and, and all the Avengers for the good work that you do. Thank, uh, thank you to Iron Man. He's a cool guy. I like him and Spider-Man. Tell Spider-Man I said hello. Thank you, Captain America. Uh, Nick Pearlberg said, as a fellow big guy, I appreciate you, Chetty. Oh, I bow to you, sir. I bow to any other large gentleman portly sir out there. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Wow, that's so nice. Uh, Jelly Helma says, crazy. I was crazy once. They locked me in a little white room. I liked it there. I died there. They buried me where the flowers grow. One grew down and tickled my nose. It almost drove me crazy. Crazy. I was crazy once. Ah, <laughs> God, he's this good. He's very nice. I like. And finally, we have Curious Man. Uh, Curious Man said, Worst job ever, shoveling concrete in July in Fargo, North Dakota. Runner up, uh, plastic pipe butt welder in an unair conditioned steel building in July in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah, that is not fun, dude. That was from the video when I asked, uh, Worst jobs ever. Yeah, that is not fun. Sweating, I used to work in a in a, play, in a garden center, and it, man, it had no air conditioning and 40 degree weather. As you can imagine, Chetty did not do too well there. I, I was sweating quite, uh, <laughs> had to change my shirts a couple times, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Number 10, girl troubles. Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg was a kind and loving mother, so long as you were a boy. Unfortunately for the royal mom, she had a great difficulty giving birth to a male heir. So when her daughter, Christina, was born, Maria proclaimed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Eleonora often called her a monster. Oh yeah, and she did try to kill her on several occasions. Nothing says mental stability like blaming your daughter for being a daughter, and not more like a son, because the male-dominated patriarchy that is royal society has no effect on this, right? Number nine, eyes on Irene. Irene was born into nobility and worked her way up the royal hierarchy. So why is Irene on this list? That's because she's probably the worst mother ever. When her son Constantine grew into adulthood, he made efforts to sideline his mother and challenge her position as a ruler. Irene, feeling some angry mom energy, retaliated in probably the worst way. In 797, Irene organized the capture of her son, and when he tried to escape, ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Constantine would later die of his injuries. Listen, I've had my fair share of minutes clocked out in the timeout corner. You can ask any one of my teachers, they'll tell you. And maybe even a few times today I should be putting the timeout corner too. But holy shit, mom, eye gouging? I, mean, I ain't that bad. Sheesh. Number eight, no cake for you. Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France, and for good reason. To make a long story short, she was part of the upper class nobility who benefited from the poor and overworked. When in a time of economic ruin, she still found a way to live a life of excess, while literally everyone else suffered. Spending all of France's money on completely ridiculous items, even by Lady Gaga standards, she jokingly became known as Madame Deficit. Eventually, she would be executed in the revolution. The expression, let them eat cake, was most likely not said by her or by anyone, but 
regardless if it was, it's a statement to show the complete disconnect and ignorance the nobility had when understanding just how bad things were for the working class. They most likely didn't care either. People were starving and putting heads on pikes. Do you really think they had time for cake, your highness? Oh, to be as beautiful and ignorant as an 18th century queen. Number seven, lovers touch. Some couples flourish, others fizzle out. Some keep their privacy and others like to make out in the hallways, right in front of everyone. Yeah, you know the ones. It's always by a classroom you have to walk by, or it's by your locker. Joanna of Castile leans more towards awkward locker makeouts. It's speculated that she may have had some form of mental illness. After her mother fell ill, she was reported not to be eating or sleeping, which doesn't sound that bad, actually. She was also a very envious person who oftentimes expressed her distaste for her husband's mistresses, reportedly attacking one on occasion, which again, doesn't sound that bad. And when her husband died of illness, she kept very close to the man's body and traveled over 600 kilometers with it, where he was to be buried, where she would often open the casket and embrace the cadaver and kiss him. Oh, okay, that's where the unholiness is, gotcha. I know medical knowledge wasn't great, but if your husband died of an illness, you couldn't seriously think that kissing him was a good idea. This is like the third royal I've come across that has a fixation on corpses. Sometimes you just gotta let the dead be dead, man. Number six, who are you gonna call? Queen Maria I of Portugal might have actually been insane. And no, not like, come on down to my local car dealership, these prices are insane. More like the Joker on a magic white powder that shan't be named just in case. I don't want to make you too big angie. She was known for ranting and raving, screaming that she had been damned. Perhaps it was phantoms of the night demonizing the poor soul. In attempts to cure her madness, such advanced scientific treatments like bloodletting and enemas were tried in order to cure her. The enema kind of makes sense. Maybe she's a little blocked up. It happens. I don't know. There were other attempts to cure her of her madness, but nothing seemed to work. While her first years in power were good, no one was ready for what they got afterwards. Hi, yes, uh, I'm calling from the royal court. We think the queen needs an exorcism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we tried that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried that too. Yes, and we did try the uh, tried and true method of enema, yes. How soon can you get here? Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Yes, I am available between the hours of eight to five. Mm-hmm. Number five, A2 Brute. Agrippina of Rome was like many mothers, in the sense that she would do anything for her kids. I'm sure every mom at home watching would scheme and slaughter their way through Roman nobility in order for her son to become emperor, right? I mean, come on, it's for the family after all. She only did it a few times and sees the wealth of nobles which further solidified her powerful position. And her son, her beautiful baby boy Nero. How did the young lad return the favor of all this bloodthirst and treachery? Like mother, like son. Chose to fatally remove her of her power. What a nice family story right there. My mom usually just makes turkey with the stuffing, but maybe I can ask for the Roman throne this Christmas. Mom! Number four, revenge. Boudicca was the wife of a man who had spent his time serving the Roman Empire. So when a deal was altered Darth Vader style by the Romans over what would happen to her husband's kingdom, she was pissed. Karen pissed. To be fair, she did have a point. They did unsavory and unholy things to her and her daughters. Plus, the Romans totally lied about not annexing their kingdom. Okay, so now it was time for some revenge. She gathered all the people she could and went on the attack. The Romans surprisingly did not fare that well. Boudicca was having such good luck she decided to burn London down. Of course, no civilians were harmed in the process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a lot of people probably didn't do too well as humans can't live in fire. Sure, she was owed some revenge, but burning down a whole city? That's a lot. The Romans did eventually catch up, and she was forced to drink poison in order to avoid capture. She is remembered as somewhat of a hero to some. Number 3. Girl Power Tamar of Georgia was a woman who didn't take kindly to men questioning the rule of a woman. As you would wind up dead. She is, no she is noted for having a hand in the Golden Age of Georgia. Funny enough, she was made a saint even though she vanquished all the orthodox clergymen at the time, for also questioning her rule. Her husband aided in conquering more land, but when he couldn't keep it in his pants, she banished him and remarried. You go girl, you commit acts of unholiness and stand up for yourself. Number 2. Serial Killer? Daria Saltkova was not necessarily a queen, but she was Russian nobility. She had strong connections with the royal court and other Russian nobility. She was also very unholy. Now, Maybe you can blame it on her being widowed. Maybe she's just crazy. But her actions were sadistic. She's noted for having severely tormented her serfs and would straight up just kill them. 
with numbers reaching at least 138. At first, complaints about family members disappearing after working for her royal nightmare were ignored. She was just too powerful and connected. Eventually, a petition was put together and shown to Catherine the Great, where it was decided Daria would be tried publicly. She spent one hour in a public space in Moscow where people scorned her for her crimes. She was then sentenced to prison where the rest of her days were spent. She is also at times compared to Elizabeth Bathory, who committed similar non nightmare inducing crimes. Just kidding, they were an absolute nightmare. Number one, Her Royalness Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth II may be the modern Queen of England, but that does not make her free of controversy and unholiness. If you are to believe in conspiracy theories, then perhaps old Blighty had a hand in a few things that to a normal person would be considered immoral. The death of Princess Diana immediately comes to mind, as there is some evidence to suggest the family is behind it, and her being the queen and all, it's easy to make the connection. But perhaps the most unholy crime ever committed, apparently the queen likes her sandwiches with the crust cut off. Imagine all the extra time needed to trim the crust off every sandwich. I want to talk to HR just thinking about all the extra work. But maybe you can cut the crust off of mine? Um, don't tell anyone though. Okay, thanks. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later. But Queen Bess, a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number 8, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. Pirate Queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530 around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess and not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy 
every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy, was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right, technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. 
kind of, but she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over three 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon. She has an inner piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster, end quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you having a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. 
At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Rana Valona, was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's horrible. Rana Lova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman. He is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert, they viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. At number three, Evil Empress. 
This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wuzetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe Cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift, but if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay, it's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, 
it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you. I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death, every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about 
any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Atan. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Atan was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her and she wanted to find an escape and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. 
Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal Curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad. It's tragic. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial, so Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest. Horrible. That's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy. Listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. 
So Mary was close, but now what? Well, Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back. I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day, and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rocked the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrett, only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like a conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. 
last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young end, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. What do you guys think?